Thank you, Claire. Hi, everybody. I see some familiar faces out there. Hi, Karen. <laughs> My former colleague from the spokesman. Or anyway. Um, well, I'm excited to be here tonight. I, this book is uh, it's very good. It's very interesting, and it goes far. It, it goes far and deep, I guess, is my, is my impression about it in impressive ways. I guess I would start by asking Sierra if you might just talk about how this murder that happened here in Spokane in uh, 200, uh, 2013, I believe, I might be, uh, how that connects to the wider events of the book that you wrote. Right, yeah, I think, um, you know, probably most of you are familiar with uh, the murder that occurred, um, the murder of Douglas Carlisle in Spokane in 2013. Um, but I actually had come uh, into, the, um, into that murder story by a different way, which was through the Fort Berthold Indian Reservation in North Dakota, um, which in the in around 2009, 2010, had found itself in the middle of the Bakken oil boom. Um, and I was a reporter at a small magazine in Colorado called High Country News at the time. And I started going to the Bakken um, to write about the oil boom and, and to write about the transformation of this tribe, the Mandan Hadatsa Rikra Nation. And in the course of reporting on the oil boom, I, I became really interested in crime and the rising crime related to the boom, um, particularly because the tribe has no criminal jurisdiction over non-native people who are operating within its borders. So um, there was an influx of a lot of non-native oil workers um, and uh, there, this led to this culture of impunity on the reservation where um, a lot of people sensed that um, they could sort of live outside the law. So I'd been reporting on that and I'd been reporting on crimes that seemed to be sort of blossoming in that, um, within that culture of impunity. And I um, came across the murder of Casey Clark, who was a young white oil worker from Washington State um, who had gone to the reservation in 2012, um, actually end of 2010, um, and uh, was murdered or he was he disappeared um, and uh, when I heard about this murder around early 2014 I decided to go back to the reservation and investigate that um, and that was really what led me to the murder of Douglas Carlisle it turned out that these two murders were connected in um, uh, really unexpected ways and that it involved this um, sort of vast conspiracy um, of people who were doing business in the Bakken oil fields um, and then were um, uh, committing crimes or covering up those crimes for a pretty impressively long period of time. And so uh, how was it that the Carlisle murder tended without giving uh, you know, spoiling the whole narrative that you tell. How was it that that story helped connect some of the dots um, for investigators and maybe to some degree for you as well? Yeah, I mean, I don't want to give too much of the story away because um, right. the Carlo sure. murder does come two thirds of the way through the book um, right. and, and opens up, um, it provides access for investigators um, to like a whole world of crime that they didn't realize existed prior to uh, Carlisle's murder. So um, I don't know, if, you know, if you were reading the Spokesman Review at the time, you may have come across stories about um, uh, in the investigation of the murder that um, police officers had found a glove in um, the backyard of the Carlisle's residence um, and that through um, linking, DNA, through uh, analyzing the DNA found on that glove, they were actually able to connect um, his murder to, um, to a hitman. Um, and that hitman then proceeds to um, tell investigators quite a lot about these crimes that were taking place, um, not only in Spokane, but also on the reservation. Um, so yeah, I think that's as far as I'll go. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I don't want to spoil any. I will say this, as someone who followed that case here in town, that this book, there's plenty for you in this book. If you think you know everything about it, you don't. Um, so the title of the book is actually someone's name. Uh, let's see, Yellow Bird. I wonder if you could talk about how you came to 
to find her and to focus on her as a way of telling this story. Yeah, I, so I met Lisa in the end of 2014. I'd gone to the reservation, um, as I said, to investigate the murder of Casey Clark. Um, I was interested in that murder because um, it had been a really big event on the reservation um, and it had, was sort of upending the politics of the tribal government um, in this really uh, profound way. And I wanted to understand like what had happened, first of all, to Casey Clark, where he was, they still hadn't found him. Um, and then also what his, mur what the connection was between his murder and the tribal chairman. Um, from, it was the tribal chairman's property that Casey Clark disappeared from. Um, and so I, I went back to the reservation around the time of the election um, of this tribal chairman to try to figure out, try to dig up more information. Um, and I was hoping to write a magazine story about it actually. Um, but I, one, one of, through being there, I, I heard from someone who said, oh, you're looking into that murder. Um, you really need to meet my cousin, Lissa Yellowbird. Um, she's been searching for Casey Clark for years. So I, I met Lissa. Um, we got together um, one night. It was like the night of this election when the chairman had lost his seat um, in large part due to this murder, I believe. And, and she, um, we were talking and through the course of our conversation, it occurred to me that not only had she spent years searching for Casey Clark's body in an effort to open up that case, but she also had like really intimate knowledge of this crime to a degree that was pretty remarkable. Um, she had involved herself in the lives of the people she uh, believed were responsible for this crime um, and had uh, begun like months to years of correspondence with them um, and had all their text messages that she'd saved over the course of many years. She had phone conversations. She had um, scenes that she just recorded on her iPhone as she was, you know, wandering around and having conversations with people. And so her own search was, she had documented it to this really impressive degree, impressive to me as a journalist, um, <laughs> because it's rare that uh, someone is documenting a story that thoroughly as they're kind of moving through it. Um, and uh, she offered to let me see these documents. Um, so I, after I met her in the end of 2014, I flew out to Fargo, North Dakota, which is where she was living at the time. Um, and she was working as a welder. So she would just go uh, to work during the day and then she would um, open up her computer to me and, and let me just sift through the hard drive and look through all of these documents that she had collected. And it was just thousands upon thousands of pages um, that gave me this, just a really intimate look into this crime. And so I was interested in the crime, but you know, the book is named after her. And I think that people reading the book and expecting a pretty straightforward true crime story might be disappointed. Um, you know, this is a work of journalism. It's a work of investigative journalism, but it's also a portrait of Lissa, who I found to just be an incredibly dynamic, brilliant and fascinating person who was highly flawed and who had um, actually just gotten out of prison herself, um, who had a history of crime herself, um, who had struggled with addiction at points in her life. Um, and, I also understood that her, you know, her fascination, her desire to help solve this crime was both out of a desire to actually help Casey Clark's mother, um, like help bring justice for her, but also to try to make her tribal community more aware of what was really happening through the oil boom and the ways that this oil boom was changing their uh, community, not necessarily for the better. Um, and so through this crime and by looking at this crime through Lissa's eyes, I began to really kind of trace this lineage of, of white violence through her tribal community um, and kind of looking at these episodes, um, these traumatic episodes that the tribe had gone through um, beginning, you know, long ago with the Indian Wars and genocides, with um, removals, with uh, taking of land, um, boarding schools, all the way up into um, uh, the present, which um, a lot of tribal members consider the oil boom to be this sort of new, new layer of trauma in the tribe's history. 
So it, you write something, uh, I believe it's in, in Afterward, that, that um, you considered the violence in this case to be American violence, or the violence of America, I think is, is how you put it. And um, I presume that's some of what you mean by that, but I'd be interested in hearing you talk more about how you think um, uh, this was the violence of America. Right, yeah, I originally began to report on the reservation because I was interested in the ways in which outside interests gain access to indigenous resources. Um, and, you know, this is a pattern that has been in the making for centuries um, from, you know, the initial uh, federal laws that, you know, institutionalized the taking of native land. Um, but then, you know, I think, uh, some some native scholars you might hear talk about um, uh, that you know corporations in many ways have replaced um, government interests in the way that land is accessed on reservations and resources are accessed on reservations. Um, so what you had on Fort Berthold in the case of the oil boom is you had um, oil companies that were searching for allies within the tribal government, um, within the tribe itself, uh, to create alliances and to um, gain access to resources um, that with, uh, you know, through these like very complicated federal laws, they still have to get approval from um, federal officials to access, um, to access those resources. But I was really interested in just like the actual, you know, mechanics of that, like how, how do companies go about kind of getting across these tribal borders and, and um, acquiring those resources. Um, at the same time, I recognize that, yeah, I, I was looking at that in the context of, I was looking at that understanding that this was part of like a, lo a long pattern of that exploitation. Um, and certainly a lot of tribal members benefited very well from this oil boom. And, and um, I think there are reasons, there are arguments to be made that in certain ways the boom was, was um, beneficial for certain members of that tribe and maybe even created some uh, temporary economic stability for the tribe um, in a way that you know, they hadn't had before. Um, at one point I interviewed the tribal chairman who talked a lot about how um, uh, he saw the oil boom as, as sort of an opportunity for sovereignty, um, a way for the tribe to become less dependent on the federal government. You know, the tribe relied um, on federal funds for like 90% of its um, budget. And he told me that puts them in a really vulnerable position. And so the tribe, you know, the oil boom was an opportunity for them to sort of regain some element of independence. Um, but at the same time, it really um, cost members quite a lot as well. I mean, the people who were already struggling continued to struggle. The people who didn't have access to those resources continued to struggle, um, and some struggled even more. Um, the influx of the rapid influx of money definitely led to um, an increase in addiction, uh, drug addiction on the reservation. Um, and that also led to an increase in violence. Um, so, yeah, I, you know, I was examining, I was examining the way that um, violence moves across communities, <laughs> um, the way that violence moves through generations, um, the way that that violence is internalized. Um, you know, a lot of Lissa and her family, um, who are the main subjects of the book, talk a lot about shame and the way that, um, you know, they've been taught to be ashamed um, over, you know, over the past uh, couple centuries. Um, and uh, that shame is, is internalized violence. And so the book deals a lot with, um, with that internalized violence as well um, and the way that uh, people cope with their own trauma. Um, it, it, you, I think you brought a personal knowledge of bust, like the, the other side of the boom, uh, to to this as when you're doing your reporting. I'm assuming that affected the way you you looked at, at what was going on there. That, that you kind of carried that with you as you were seeing the 
the, you know, the, the good, whatever good there might have been in the boom times. But um, I assume that was the lens that you viewed what was happening through in part. Is that fair to say? Yeah, I mean, I think um, it was really interesting interviewing tribal members of the, over the sort of arc of this boom. You know, I do think in the beginning there was quite a lot of, um, uh, a lot of people were hopeful that um, they might benefit from it. Um, they were hopeful that their situations might change in some positive way. Um, I think that hopefulness definitely um, waned as um, people began to realize that uh, the boom was sort of creating um, economic inequality on the reservation or, or just exacerbating the economic inequality that was already there. Um, you know, the people who had land were earning royalties, the people who didn't have land were not. Um, and, uh, and then meanwhile, you know, there was a lot of concern around the tribe and how they were going to spend their resources and were they equipped to actually invest the money that they were receiving in a way that would benefit them in the future or were they just going to have to keep throwing it at these infrastructure projects to even make, um, you know, kind of keep up with the damages that the boom was wreaking on the reservation. Um, so yeah, I, I think I had that perspective a little bit going into this. I actually, I'd lived in um, Appalachia in coal country before. And so, and I lived in coal country at the very end of the coal boom um, when, you know, companies, there was very little coal to dig underground anymore. So companies were literally just blowing off the tops of mountains to scrape the little seams of coal that were left. Um, and, you know, I interviewed a lot of coal, uh, coal executives about kind of the end of, end of that industry and, and you could see it in the communities. And I think I'd always wondered as, you know, when I was first going to the Bakken, I thought, wouldn't it be really interesting to come back here in 50 years and see what it's like kind of after this is all over. But then because of um, various market forces, you know, the boom ended much faster than people expected and, um, and workers cleared out of there much faster than people expected. And so, you know, um, oil prices are low right now. People are learn earning a lot less money than they did at the height of the boom. Um, some people are still earning money, but yeah, I, I think the bust, I, I already had the perspective, I already had sort of bust in my mind as I was, as I was observing the boom. Um, I wouldn't say what I saw afterwards surprised me, but I do think that I was able to kind of, I guess a little bit objectively, just try to trace um, the thinking of the people who were really um, experiencing it themselves and, and see sort of how their thinking changed over time. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you can describe a little bit what the process of reporting this was, the information gathering, which took, which it seems like it took a long time and a lot of visits. Yeah, um, so I spent five years researching this book in particular, um, but the book also integrates um, reporting I did beginning in 2011. Um, uh, I... <laughs> It, the book is very multifaceted, as I said, you know, there's, um, there's the story of the murder mystery. <laughs> um, and through that, I spent, uh, you know, years basically just um, completely immersed in public documents. Um, I spent a lot of time in the Spokane Police Department <laughs> watching films <laughs> of um, interrogations of suspects. Um, I spent a lot of time interviewing, um, doing sort of more classic style investigative journalism, you know, interviewing all the police officers involved, attorneys involved. Um, uh, but on the other side, you know, this story is a very intimate look into Lissa's life and to her family. So um, at the same time that I was doing this more kind of like traditional style investigative journalism, you know, sifting through public records, doing interviews, at the, I was also very much immersed in Lissa's life um, to a degree that, you know, I, I am not typically for other journalism um, articles that I write. You know, this was I knew that the book I was going to write was going to be like novelistic in nature. It was going to follow Lissa's life um, in a 
uh, very detailed way and even maybe, um, you know, dig pretty deeply into her struggles. Um, and in order to do that, I needed a tremendous amount of trust. Um, and not only from her, but from her family. Um, so, you know, a lot of those five years that I spent working on this book, I was also um, just living alongside Lissa. I was going with her to the Badlands of North Dakota and searching for the body of Casey Clark. Um, I was just hanging out with her uh, family members, with her children, you know, with her mother and grandmother on the reservation. Um, I was just living inside their life. Um, and just trying to understand what makes Lissa tick, why she cared so much about this crime, why she became so obsessed. Um, and also tried to understand kind of the way that her work was influencing um, the people around her, her family. Well, I, I like the fact that you described the, the book as novelistic. And, and I wanted to ask a journalism question that comes you may not have this presumption that is the form of this, the basis, the basis of this question, but I feel like I grew up with an assumption that I now think is a false assumption that, that there's, there's kind of rigor and creativity. Mm -hmm. There's reporting, good reporting and writing. And the things don't necessarily, like I, I worked among editors who would identify reporters as um, reporters and writers, you know? Um, I, I felt like there's this kind of false idea that factual rigor is somehow not in the same realm as being creative as a writer or a thinker or the way you approach the subject. Um, this novel is very well written. It's very creatively organized. I wondered if that tension between the, this idea of journalism, which is the simplest, most basic idea of it, and then the creative realm, which is, it's there. It's not like there aren't examples of that, but I'd just like to hear your thoughts about sort of maybe where you came up within your, your thinking about that process and how you try to maintain rigor while being creative and how you try to be creative while being rigorous with the facts. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great question. I mean, I, so I actually have never been a newspaper journalist um, and I have great admiration for newspaper journalists because I am terrible at quick turnaround deadlines. Um, <laughs> but I, uh, you know, I began my career as a magazine journalist, um, which is a little bit different in the sense that, you know, I, I wouldn't say there's a difference in terms of rigor, but there's a difference in terms of narrative and also the length of stories that you're writing and, and, and the way that those stories are frequently formatted. So, you know, I was always, I've always been writing and or looking for stories that, you know, have, have, are timely and have relevance to what's happening in our lives and in our world today, but that, um, but that ha also have the elements of fiction in a lot of ways that have plot, that have, you know, characters that have um, a, setting that have all all those elements that sort of make a narrative um feel more novelistic um so I, I think that was my inclination already um you know people refer to that form of journalism with a lot of different terms you'll hear people say um you know long-form journalism or narrative journalism or literary reportage or you know there are all kinds of names for it um but that that definitely is sort of the school of thought I was raised in and in the work I've been doing for the last 10 years. Um, I, you know, but at the same time, you know, I can't, uh, like I, you know, everything in my book has to be, has to be true. <laughs> um, you know, so it, it is in certain ways limiting, you know, I can't, um, I can't go in and make up something that Lissa is thinking. Um, I can't go in and, uh, you know, make up dialogue. Um, uh, you know, there were certain like hard and fast journalistic rules that I was holding myself to, um, you know, I just fact checked the book. Um, and, and those are important because you need to gain your reader's trust. Um, so yeah, I, you know, it, in order to write something that is novelistic in nature, but that is 100% factual, um, you have to report it really rigorously <laughs> because you have to spend a tremendous amount of time going back to everyone that you're writing about and saying, wait, can you tell me, can you describe that scene to me again? 
just, I want to make sure I get it right. Or like, can you, like in that moment, do you remember what you would have been thinking? Or in that moment, do you remember what color your shirt was? <laughs> or, um, you know, what was the painting that your grandma had hanging on the wall when you walked into her apartment on that such and such day, you know, um, just like really, really, really intimate detail. And so that's why this book took as long as it did was to, um, was to be able to, yeah, put my readers in, in the story as if, um, you know, as if they were moving through it themselves. And you're in there a bit too. And, and it's interesting. And I think as a reader, it, it makes a reader feel uh, like they're in good hands to see you, you just sometimes say what you do, you know, I'm cross-checking this with this person or I'm going back to this person to interview them again. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Anyway. Um, oh man, I had just had a 50 year old uh, <laughs> brain moment where I forgot the next question I was going to ask you. Have you, so you know, a lot of these people pretty well that are in the book. Have you heard from some of them? Um, have they had a chance to see the book or know what's in it? I don't know. Have you gotten feedback from the folks that you, for, that you wrote about? Um, yeah. I mean, I, uh, I talked to Lissa and her family regularly. I saw them last week. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, I, and also Lissa and various family members of hers, um, I let them see the book before it went to print, um, which is also not something journalists typically do, and I had never done before, um, but that felt important to me um, in this process. I, I trusted that our relationship was close enough that they kind of understood what I was trying to do, and we were on the same page about, um, you know, how they could help me make sure I had gotten closer to the truth um, through through reading it and commenting on it before I went to press. Um, I, you know, the book is pretty critical of a lot of people. <laughs> um, and uh, so no, I have not, I've not heard from everyone. Um, you know, there were a lot of, a lot of people who were wrapped up in these crimes and various, to various degrees. And, um, and uh, so, yeah, I haven't, but I, I am, I've been heartened to know that the book is being read widely on the reservation. Um, and I've, you know, like a lot of people in the tribal police department have read it. Um, and uh, it's been really interesting getting a lot of, um, I've gotten a lot of feedback from um, people who are sort of lesser characters in the book. And, and they've said, you know, wow, I, I didn't believe that. I can't believe that all those things were connected in that way. Or um, I think I think most people who I interviewed had understood the outlines of the story, um, but didn't necessarily understand the depth of it. I wonder what changed or what maybe surprised you between deciding you were going to write this book and finishing the book like what was it that happened in between there that you found yourself surprised by or underestimated or didn't foresee um hmm i mean there are i think uh yeah many ways in which i was surprised um i think well from a craft standpoint i think um I, you know, I was definitely surprised that I like pulled it off. <laughs> I think, you know, I, I would, uh, in the beginning, I, I'm used to write, I'm sort of a perfectionist when it comes to writing and I uh, am used to writing shorter pieces. And so I'm, I typically would put one sentence down on the page at a time and make sure it was perfect. Um, and you just can't write a book in that way. <laughs> um, so I, I got, uh, some practice in writing a bad first draft. Um, and uh, that was honestly really psychologically challenging for me to do. And, um, and yeah, so I, I understood that in order to successfully write a book, you have to be comfortable with putting some less than perfect words down on paper and, and you know, drafting from there. Um, I, when it comes to the story itself, you know, there were a lot of things that surprised me as I was investigating the crimes in this book. Um, I think the main thing that surprised me, um, I would say, you know, going to the Spokane Police Department and being able to watch the videos, uh, video interviews with um, 
some of the people who were involved in these crimes. And, and understanding through those videos, the ways in which they perceived themselves and what they had done. Um, I think what surprised me most about the story was, first of all, how many people were adjacent to or involved in this crime and many people without even realizing it. And sort of, I, I learned a lot about the nature of complicity and denial and the stories we tell ourselves in order to you know, sort of protect ourselves from the truth. Um, and also, I think, yeah, again, watching these videos, what I, what I heard over and over again was that a lot of these people perceive themselves to be really good. Um, and there's this moment in particular when, um, you know, the hitman was being interviewed and he's describing one of the murders and he starts to cry and he's, he just pauses and he says, I'm really not violent. And I, that just really struck me um, that he was describing this incredibly violent act. Um, but it was something that he never imagined he could have done. Um, and, and so I, you know, I've said, as I've said, you know, I, I think of this book as being a book about violence and being about, about the ways that violence um, moves through communities and, and, um, and is passed through generations. And I, and I think a lot of, yeah, a lot of what I thought about and a lot of what surprised me in the course of writing this book was, um, was our capacity, our ability to deny our own capacities for violence. Um, yeah. That moment really hit me as well. Um, and I don't know, anyway, it was a moving moment to realize he, as bad as what he did, still this person who, I don't know, is full of all the things that we're all full of, our inability to see ourselves. Anyhow, um, you have talked about this and, and written about it, uh, what your experience was like telling this story, uh, not as a member of the tribe, but uh, from being outside the community and in this age where we talk a lot about appropriation and how do we, who gets to tell whose stories. Um, how did you approach that? What, what did you end up, how did you end up, you know, deciding to, to move forward and, and what did you feel like the right way to do that was given those considerations? Right, yeah, I, as you mentioned, like as I was working on the book, the question of who has the right to tell whose story um, was becoming a really big part of the national dialogue. Um, not necessarily in journalism exactly, um, but certainly in um, fiction um, and in you know other other arts. Um, but you know, but the conversation was entering uh, journalism as well, and. Um, you know, people were, a, a lot of what I was hearing was like, you know, our, our job is to tell other people's stories, you know, our job is to go into communities that are not our own and, um, to be able to, uh, you know, ask questions, um, in order, in order for us to understand, um, these things we're already unfamiliar with. Um, you know, that is the nature of journalism and, and journalism is something that I believe is essential. And obviously I've chosen this as a career because I believe in it. <laughs> um, but at the same time, I think I, you know, I felt uncomfortable um, telling a story that was so novelistic in nature about this woman whose experience I had very little in common with. Um, you know, she's someone who's both a citizen of the United States and a citizen of her tribe. Um, you know, her identity is wrapped up in being a Rikra, um, in being someone from this reservation. Um, and so, and, and I also recognize that that wasn't my only limitation. You know, I'm like, I'm not a, I'm a woman, but I'm not a mother, you know, I'm a, um, I've never been addicted to drugs, you know, I, there were a lot of incredibly intense experiences that she had had in her life that I didn't, couldn't necessarily identify with exactly. Um, but, you know, at the same time, I asked a lot of questions to myself, thinking like, okay, 
you know, I am, I am telling the story. Lissa has given me permission to sort of come into her life and, and ask all these questions and to put it down on paper. Um, so, you know, how am I going to handle this in a way that hopefully will feel meaningful and truthful to her and her family? Um, so I made a lot of decisions, you know, like I, one of those decisions I mentioned earlier, I had Lissa read the book um, before. Uh, and, you know, she, she was like, Sarah, I have such bad ADHD. I, have you ever seen me read a book in the, you know, four and a half years we've been hanging out together? And uh, so <laughs> she was like, you're gonna have to read the book to me. So I flew out um, and brought copies of the book. And then of course she just like read it herself anyways. Um, but she, uh, she I, th I think when she first read it, she realized it, we'd already always had very transparent conversations about how I was going about the story because I, I would constantly bounce things off her. I'd be like, so I'm kind of interpreting it like this. Am I doing that right? And she'd be like, no, I didn't think that at all. I thought this other thing. Or she'd be like, oh yeah, that's interesting. I guess that really is what I was feeling. Um, but when she read the book kind of all at once, I think she really realized, she understood what my intentions were. She understood what the important themes were. Um, and she realized that the hardest scenes in the book, she felt like I hadn't quite captured yet. Um, that some of the most difficult things that had happened to her in le her life or some of the crimes she committed herself, I hadn't quite, like, um, yeah, I hadn't quite reached sort of the depth of her darkness, I guess. Um, and so we went back and she, spent more time with me um, kind of going through these really intense scenes and, and helping them, helping me make them uh, more truthful and more honest. Um, and I was incredibly grateful to her for that. I mean, I, I think it's just, uh, it's very unusual to come up across a person um, like that who is so unashamed <laughs> of her flaws and what she's gone through that she would like really help me get to the depth, get into the depths of some of the darkest experiences of her life. Uh, well, do we have some other questions or should I maybe ask one more and then go to other questions? What do you think, Claire? Yeah, well, why don't you ask one more and then we'll move to audience questions. We'll have plenty of time for audience okay. questions. Okay. Well, um, I wonder if, because you reported over time over what was happening in the Bakken oil fields, and, uh, um, I wonder if that is still, um, a subject of interest to you as a journalist, if you're still working in some way in that way, or what what you're up to now, what you're working on now? Um, yeah, I mean, it's, I feel like it was a story that was such a big part of my life that I will continue to follow it. <laughs> um, I am not sure, I'm not working on anything um, directly related to the boom at this moment. I did, um, I did do a one-off story for This American Life in the spring. Um, it was an episode about, um, Lissa's search, so Lissa, the protagonist in the book, she, um, after searching for Casey Clark, she uh, was contacted by a number of Native American families who were looking for their own loved ones, um, and particularly families who were missing daughters, uh, missing and murdered indigenous women. Um, so she has become one of the main boots on the ground people who now searches for missing indigenous men and women um, throughout the upper Midwest. Um, but she kind of made that transition into searching for indigenous people when um, her own niece went missing. And so um, I did a radio story with Lissa and um, that aired on This American Life about um, her search for her niece. Um, but yeah, right now I'm, I'm not focused on anything related to the Bakken. Um, I'm uh, working on some shorter things, which has been really nice. <laughs> I've also been taking a bit of a break, which also is really nice. Um, yeah, I just did a story about climate refugees from Saipan, which is a U.S. territory in the North Pacific. Um, but, yeah. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's in Harper's, Harper's Magazine, October issue. If you guys it's in the, the current? Mm -hmm. Okay, yep. all right. Look that up. Let's see. So, do we have some questions uh, from audience? Yeah, I know that Karen has one. Karen, would you like to unmute yourself and ask? Yes. 
Yes, I was curious about um, your relationship. I, I'm a former investigative reporter myself, and I was interested in your relationship with Casey Clark's mother. I found that inter interesting how over time that changed. She was initially cooperative, then she became more reluctant. And, and, and can you speak to that? Because as an experience I've had as a, as a, as a reporter, that Mo people's motivations can change over time. So I was just curious about that. And then just as, as a follow-up too, um, I wondered if there have been any political ramifications. I mean, you really laid bare a lot of the corruption in the, in the whole Bakken enterprise and whether there's been any kind of political um, spin-offs from that, you know, crackdown on, fra uh, on actors and fracking around the country or, um, or any, any more any more investigation of how these resource companies are, are exploiting tribes? So kind of two, two questions. Yeah. Um, yeah, so to your first question, Casey's mom. Um, so I, I did meet her. Um, she and Lissa had, you know, a complicated relationship, which I explore in the book. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, she initially had reached out to Lissa, um, or, you know, they'd communicated in the beginning and, and she'd been very um, grateful for Lissa's help. And then you know, later on their relationship got more complicated for, for various reasons, um, some of which I talk about um, in the story. Um, you know, as a, as a journalist, it's hard. I, she wasn't interested in interviewing with me for the book. Um, and, um, so, you know, I wanted to be respectful of her, of what she's gone through, you know, like, um, it's really hard to lose a son. Uh, and I, um, so I, but at the same time, I couldn't extract her from the story in an honest way. Um, it was important that I gave her credit for kind of, you know, where she'd entered into this investigation and also, um, yeah, so, so it wasn't, you know, I, I like I had with other sources, um, with other people, people in the book, you know, I had lots of text message conversations and email conversations between her and Lisa over the years. And I just, um, chose not to, you know, I used very, very tiny amount, um, just as it related to Lisa's, um, Lisa's role in the investigation, but I, um, did not go into her story very much. Um, so, uh, and then let's see your other question about um, tribal, um, about uh, you know, companies accessing the reservation. Um, you know, I'm not sure there have really been any, uh, any ramifications for companies in particular. <laughs> um, I will say there have been political ramifications on the reservation. Um, just a few weeks ago, um, several tribal councilmen were indicted um, for engaging in fraudulent activity with um, oil companies. Um, and so the FBI, uh, just in the past few months, has kind of renewed an investigation into um, the ways that, uh, yeah, the ways that these companies have been sort of operating in conjunction with certain tribal leaders, um, uh, which is something I also write about in the book, um, sort of, yeah, those, those relationships and, and how they were kind of sowing a lot of distrust among tribal members and who were not sure that their leaders were necessarily representing them in the way they wanted to be represented. Um, I don't know much about those cases yet. They're just kind of, they're just beginning to, uh, blossom. <laughs> so probably no more in the coming weeks. Mm -hmm. uh, we have, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Karen. Well, one, just uh, one uh, quick one. Are, are you still continuing to write for High Country News on, on these, on these issues of the? I'm not. Um, no, I, so I worked for High Country News for about five years, six years. Um, and yeah, I'm just, I'm freelance now and working for other magazines, um, but they continue to do great, great work. Um, they actually, um, under the leadership of Tristan Atone, who's not there anymore, but um, there was a tribal affairs desk um, that has continued to do really great um, investigative work into um, tribal issues all around the country. Um, 
so that was after my time, but, um, but it's been really great to see kind of the directions the magazine has gone. This next question is from Tom. Uh, do you have reason to think that similar dynamics have happened on other sites like Standing Rock? Um, well, I know that these dynamics, um, you know, what I sort of, what I was learning about the way that companies, um, yeah, gain access to uh, natural resources on reservations. This is something that happens all across this country, like, you know, um, you can go to uh, the Crow Reservation, you can go to Navajo Nation, you can go to, um, you know, really any, uh, any reservation that has um, uh, a great deal of resources and see these dynamics playing out. Um, you know, there are exceptions. Um, the Southern Ute uh, tribe um, in Colorado uh, has become sort of famous in Indian country for having essentially like nationalized its own resources and, and created its own oil companies and, um, and developed its resources in that way. Um, that was actually something that Tex Hall, the chairman in my book, had been really hoping to do on Fort Berthold, but for all kinds of reasons I explain, um, it didn't happen. Um, but, you know, every, every tribal community is different too. You know, every tribe is different um, in terms of the way it, it approaches um, its own natural resources. Uh, you know, Turtle Mountain um, in northern North Dakota put a ban on fracking um, during the Bakken boom. Um, they actually didn't have much oil anyways to exploit, so uh, <laughs> I, who knows what would have happened had they actually had um, a good deal of resources. Um, you know, and, but there also, I think there are also some cultural differences between certain tribes. These are, um, you know, in, in interviews with uh, tribal members on Fort Berthold, um, you know, they would frequently talk about how um, uh, Lakota and uh, the Hunkpapa Lakota in Standing Rock or Oglala Lakota in, uh, in Pine Ridge had very different approaches to land. Um, and uh, you can kind of see that with how, you know, Fort Berthold, a third of the oil that would, would have been flowing through the Dakota Access Pipeline is coming from North Dakota, or from Fort Berthold, from another reservation. And that was not something that was really talked about during the Standing Rock um, protests. And then also, you know, the, um, the Mandan Hadatsa Rikra Nation has approved many pipelines to run underneath um, Lake Sakakawea and the Missouri River up north of um, Standing Rock. So, um, so yeah, you see differences in the way that different tribal governments have, um, have handled uh, pipelines, natural resources, um, all of it. We have a question from Timothy. Timothy, would you like to unmute and ask your question? Yeah, can you, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Hello? Hi. Hi, oh, see, um, I, I met Casey Clark. He oh. followed me into a little bar in the middle of nowhere in Epping, North Dakota on the 30th of December, 2011. That was like a month and a half before his, bar, his arrest. And, he had came with a William Ulmer, who had a guy who had left Costa Rica after killing this one girl. But I wondered you I'm tangentially involved. I guess my, my son in law was evidently a, um, a, a confidential informant that started a conspiracy to distribute over a hundred grams of heroin uh, on December first. And after he uh, the, a year and a half in, in June of, of uh, 2013, uh, he was sentenced to prison and for attempted murder. And but I think that uh, that uh, James Hendrickson and um, and Timothy Sugal wanted to grow up to be just like him. And I don't know if, if you ever noticed that had the, the U.S. Attorney's Office moved on that prosecution that was in, in it was uh, count 10 of the indictment uh, that that Doug Carlisle would have been alive today. Uh, I just as the, uh, just a sordid amount of greed and all the things that the, the, 
the Carlisle family went through and Jill, Jill Williams, Katie's mother. Uh, I just, and I'm, I'm anxious to read your book. I, uh, Lisa came, I met Lisa, we, we after the New York Times article uh, uh, thing came out, I had I, I recognized the story about Casey and, his, and he'd tell me about his motorcycle racing legs and everything. But I just, I, um, and we, I went and helped, we went and looked and we kind of figured out where Casey's body's at because uh, uh, James Hendrickson was putting in a septic tank on the February 24th, 2012, two days at two, one o'clock in the morning during a blizzard after Timothy Suko had got on the train lift. I just, I just really, um, how little interest there was in finding Casey or what happened to him. And had it not been for Timothy Suko coming out and divulging what he did, there would have been no more efforts on it. Just was just how little interest the U.S. Attorney's Office, and I'm just wondering what your impressions were about the how much lack of diligence there was into Casey's missing. Yeah, um, yeah, that's all really interesting. I I write a good deal about that in the book. Um, I mean, the reason why Alyssa took this case on, right, and was as obsessed with it as she was, was because she had the sense of who was responsible for it. You know, it wasn't, this isn't exactly a who done it. You kind of know who did it from the beginning and you kind of know, but you just don't know like how many people are involved. And I think what you were getting at, um, is really interesting. You know, there is, yeah, there is a whole drug and, conspiracy going on here at the same time, um, a heroin ring. Um, and that was something that um, attorneys addressed to a degree in the, um, in the, in the trial, but really wasn't um, explored in depth. Um, I will say that the, um, so in the, in the beginning of the book was, a, um, is able to gain the attention of a, um, actually an officer with the Department of Homeland Security based in Minot. And he was really interested in investigating James Henriksen because he suspected that Henriksen was involved in, um, in drugs, in dealing drugs on the reservation and in manufacturing potentially drugs. Um, and so I think that's what you're you're referring to there. Um, and, uh, and he was, um, but, uh, you know, they, yeah, they weren't able to find, um, they weren't able to find like enough evidence of it early on. Um, I, you know, I think it's hard, it's hard to say whether or not authorities could have broken this case earlier or if it really did just take Timothy Suko. Um, certainly there was a lot of, you know, um, frustration around how slowly the investigation was moving and how few breaks in the case there were. And that was why, you know, and that's what this book is about. This is about kind of all the sort of behind the scenes um, things that Lissa was doing to try to break it open and these really creative, like non-traditional <laughs> ways. Um, so yeah, I, yeah, I mean, it's, it was, um, Douglas Carlyle could still be alive, you know, had they, had they taken that, um, had they really pushed um, the Casey Clark investigation um, to a deeper level, you know, his death would have been prevented for sure. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we just have time for one more last question. Louise, would you like to ask your question? Yeah, uh, I was wondering when you were talking about the FBI investigating the tribal members, but they're not doing any invis investigations of the oil companies that were a part of that with the collusion or whatever. <laughs> yeah, I don't know enough about those cases yet because the documents are just okay. to emerge. So, um, but you know, uh, 
there are a lot of laws protecting <laughs> um, protecting the ways that um, you know companies do business. Um, but you know the laws that um, these tribal members were violating were like you know basically like financial financial laws um, that and and federal statutes that kind of governed the handling of money within the tribe. Um, so I'm not actually sure what the companies sort of what their kind of legal or non-legal complicity was in those um, cases, but um, yeah, I am curious to look into it. But I, I think it also points back to that whole thing about another way of exploitation of tribal people, yeah. and yet and yet another way in the corporate the corporate world, corporate white world continues to get away with the exploitation but they don't. Yeah, no, I think that's an excellent point. I mean, I, you know, I don't, I see the pattern of corruption on the reservation that I was writing about um, as the product of American policy, right? Of a, a long legacy of the US government undermining um, the power of tribal governments and their ability to govern their own citizens and control their own land and resources um, and, you know, and, you know, yeah, that's a product of like a, a, a long history of systematically breaking down um, tribal institutions and then replacing them with these sort of top down systems um, that are not uh, what the tribe had before. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, it, I think your point is exactly right that it's, yeah, it's a product of, um, of a long, of a long history. Um, yeah. Continue systemic racism. <laughs> okay, well, I think we'll leave it there for tonight. Thank you all so much for coming and thank you so much, Sierra and Sean, for being willing to do this with aunties. We really appreciate it. Hope everybody has a great night. Good night. Thanks for having me. Good night. See you later. <laughs>